Goedemorgen, dames en heren. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A uh, very well, warm welcome to all of you to the annual general meeting of Unilever NV for 2018. And welcome to the Rotterdam World Trade Center. Before we begin today, I would like to ask you that you all make yourself familiar with today's security and safety information and the actions to be taken in the case of an emergency. And this is on the back of the sheet that you will have been given when you register. Let me briefly go through the agenda of today. The formal elements of today's proceedings are set out in the agenda on page three on the, of the notice of meeting. And in total, we will have 28 agenda items. And there will then also be a Q&A session. So let me make some introductions first. On my right, we have Paul Paulman, our chief executive officer. Next to Paul is Graham Pitkathley, our chief financial officer. Next to him, John Rishton, chair of the audit committee. And next to John is Strive Masiiwa, chair of the Corporate Responsibility Committee. And then on my left, we have Ritva Sotama, our chief legal officer and company secretary. Next to her, Anne Fudge, vice chair, senior independent director and chair of the Compensation Committee. And next to Anne, Faike Sibisma, chair of the Nominating and Corporate Governance Committee. Both directors who are offering themselves up for reappointment today are all distinguished in their respective fields and further information on their reappointments can be found on page four of the notice of meeting. And Fudge will be retiring from the Unilever boards at the conclusion of the 2018 AGMs, having served for nine years. And I would like to thank Anne for her excellent contributions as a Unilever non-executive director. She has brought invaluable experience to the Unilever boards and has been a great source of advice and guidance for the business. Since April 2015, Anne has served as vice chair and senior independent director and doing so playing a key role in developing our long-term business model. And I would like to thank her for her support in that role. Anne has also greatly contributed over the last few years as chair of the Compensation Committee, putting leading practices in place in our overall remuneration framework, which has helped Unilever to further strengthen its performance culture. <clears throat> so Anne, you leave with the best wishes of us all. <clears throat> this year, the board has again focused on succession, looking to appoint new directors based on their wide ranging background, skills, knowledge, and insight. And having identified Andrea Young as a potential non-executive director, we are delighted that she has agreed to join your board. Andrea is chairman and CEO of Grey Mean America. And before that, she was CEO of Avon from 1999 to 2012, making her still the longest serving female CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Since 2012, Andrea has held a number of non-executive director positions at several of the world's largest companies. Andrea brings both a global outlook and a deep understanding of the consumer goods industry. And she has a good sense of both the broader role of business in society and the importance of a long-term multi-stakeholder model. So in a moment, we will play a video from Andrea. But before I do that, as she's here today, Andrea, can you just stand up and make yourself known? Thank you. 
So Andrea, welcome, and we now will play your video. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrea Jung, President and Chief Executive Officer of Grameen America. I was born in Canada, the daughter of Chinese immigrants, and we moved to the United States shortly afterwards, where I have lived and worked ever since. I joined Avon Products in 1993 in the domestic U.S. division running the product marketing group. Shortly afterwards, I was promoted to president of Global Brand Marketing, where I directed all of the company's brands in over 100 countries. In 1997, I was promoted to president and chief operating officer, where I ran the international businesses, uh, all of the company's research and development facilities, the supply chain, uh, and was promoted several months later to president uh, and CEO, and then CEO and chairman of the board. Avon is a direct seller, a preeminent direct seller around the world of beauty and personal care products. Uh, and I had the incredible opportunity to be able to witness firsthand the power of not only changing women's lives by giving them entrepreneurship opportunities through Avon, but understanding the power of global brands in every corner of the world. In 2011, after I retired, I joined Muhammad Yunus shortly afterwards, and I'm now running Grameen America. Grameen America is the fastest growing microfinance organization in the United States. Uh, we provide capital to women and their families for small businesses, and it is an incredible opportunity to see how firsthand a little bit of capital can help them move up and out of poverty. It's a privilege and an honor to be considered to join the Unilever Board of Directors. I've been a student and an admirer and hugely inspired by Unilever for my entire career, being a lover and a passionate believer in the power of innovative global brands um, to be considered by this preeminent company to be on the board is, is, a, is a wonderful honor. Most importantly, the DNA of the company that gives so much back to society, to the communities in which you sell, it's, it's really an honor and an inspiration. So thank you very much. Good, thank you. Um, before you hear from our CEO, Paul Polman, on the state of the business, I would like to give you first a few personal observations. As I look back on a very full 2017, it's clear that the external environment in which Unilever operates remains a very volatile and fast-moving one. Rapid advances in technology, especially digital, are transforming the whole sector and changing really fundamentally the way consumers interact with brands and services. Consumption patterns are also changing as consumers gravitate more and more to products that satisfy a growing desire for naturalness and authenticity. And it all makes this a really fascinating time to be in the fast-moving consumer goods industry. Now, by anticipating these changes early and by tailoring its model accordingly, Unilever is well-placed, I believe, to take advantage of these changing market dynamics. It's clear, for example, that Connected for Growth, the organizational change program we have spoken about before, is giving the kind of additional speed, agility, and proximity to consumers that are so important in today's markets. There is also no doubt, in my view, that Unilever's unflinching commitment to sustainable and equitable growth, as reflected in Unilever's sustainable living plan, has growing resonance among consumers the world over. All these factors contributed to another strong year for Unilever in 2017, with solid revenue growth, strong profitability, and good cash flow performance. The group is also benefiting from the significant strengthening of its portfolio, with no fewer than 12 acquisitions announced or completed in 2017. 
The group has also announced the sale of the non-strategic spreads business to KKR. The confidence in our outlook was reflected earlier in 2017 when we announced a 12% increase in the dividend in the first quarter of 2017 announcement. Looking ahead, the board remains confident both in the strategy and the outlook for the group. And this confidence was again reflected last month when we announced a 8% increase in the dividend in the first quarter 2018 announcement. Over the last year, the board has given very careful and detailed consideration to simplify the group's capital structure. And like other members of the board, I am convinced, absolutely convinced, that this is necessary if Unilever is to have the strategic flexibility necessary to compete in the markets of the future. And as you will know, Unilever has been owned through two separately listed companies, a Dutch NV and a UK PLC, since, it form since its formation in 1930, so 88 years ago. And these two companies have been governed by a very complex set of agreements to maintain parity between economic rights of the respective shareholders. Now, we reviewed this dual-headed structure, and we concluded that a single holding company with one class of shares and a global pool of liquidity would bring greater simplicity and, most importantly, more flexibility to make strategic changes in our portfolio in the future, should we choose to do so. So, in March, we announced our proposal to simplify Unilever's corporate structure. And we intend to move from two legal entities to one single legal entity, incorporated and tax resident in the Netherlands. And this decision reflects the fact that the shares in Unilever NV account for approximately 55% of the group's combined ordinary share capital and trade with greater liquidity than PLC shares. Unilever will continue to be listed in London, Amsterdam, and New York. Now, following this proposed simplification, shareholders of PLC and NV will have the same relative proportions in the combined group as currently. So one new ordinary share in the new Dutch holding company will be issued for each current share in Unilever PLC or each current share in Unilever NV. In addition, shareholders of PLC and NV will have the same interest in dividend and capital distributions in the new Dutch holding company as before. With regard to your dividends, there will be no change to our policy of seeking to pay an attractive, growing, and sustainable dividend. And Unilever will continue after simplification to support, to report, and sorry, its earnings and declare dividends in euros as we have been doing uh, for many years. So the proposed changes to this corporate structure are subject to certain conditions, including applicable regulatory consents and the approval of shareholders in both this company, the NV, and Unilever PLC at extraordinary general meetings. Further information will be provided in the shareholder communication which will be circulated in advance of these extraordinary general meetings. An implementation of the new simplified structure is currently anticipated to be towards the end of 2018. So that's with regard to simplification. Let me now change topics to talk about remuneration. 
at the 2017 AGMs, you gave us your support for the implementation of a new reward framework that builds on the strong performance that Paul Polman and his team have built at Unilever over the last decade. And this approach has already been implemented successfully across Unilever's group of most senior managers worldwide. The new remuneration policy which is being put to you today for approval applies this same framework that was um, implemented for all the senior managers last year, now also for the two executive directors, the CEO and the CFO. This new policy in general is far more demanding than before and firmly aligned with our strategy and with long-term value creation. We are proposing a much simpler pay structure where long-term personal commitment through share ownership drives ultimate reward. So let me briefly summarize the main changes we are proposing to make. We will discontinue the performance share plan, the so-called GSIP, making the management co-investment plan, MCIP, our only long-term incentive plan. And that means that performance will be measured over a much longer term, and our executives have to invest much more of their own money than before in Unilever shares to be eligible for long-term incentive awards. So they really risk much more of their own money um, as they need to hold Unilever shares, more Unilever shares. So put simply, this new policy requires them to have significantly more skin in the game than they had before. We recognize that some investors and proxy voting agencies are concerned about how some of these changes will work in practice. And those of you who have taken a close look at our proposals will see that we have put in extra safeguards to ensure that any incentive payments above the current levels are fully justified by sustainable underlying long-term performance. Unilever's Compensation Committee has an established track record of setting stretching targets and exercising discretion to ensure that we only reward genuine performance in a responsible way. And as already announced, we will keep the MCIP award being made for 2018 through 2021 at 150%. Unilever has a long history of applying high standards of corporate governance. And let me state now very clearly that when and if Unilever becomes a Dutch corporation, shareholders will have an annual advisory vote on how we are implementing our new remuneration policy. And furthermore, we will also continue to provide our shareholders with a binding vote on the remuneration policy at least every three years. In the months ahead, we will consult further with our shareholders and once completed, we will return to explain how we intend to address, address the possible areas of concern before next year's AGM. Unilever is a company that has generally delivered sustained value to shareholders over the longer term. And your board believes that the principles driving the new remuneration policy will ensure that this value creation continues over the longer term for the benefit of shareholders. So now turning shortly to board evaluation, which in 2017 was externally facilitated. The results that we discussed in our 2017 board meeting in April confirmed that the board continues to perform effectively with the appropriate fo focus on in-year performance and long-term strategy for the future. 
And finally, over the last year, groups of board members have been able to gain greater exposure to Unilever through a series of extended visits around the company. And we have spent time with each of the heads of the divisions and the heads of the regions and the teams, getting a deeper insight into their individual strategies. We've visited some very strategic locations, including most recently in March, China, where we saw firsthand how the company is gearing up to win in a market that is changing perhaps faster than anywhere else in the world. So I know I speak for the whole board when I say we came away from each of those visits even more confident in the robustness of our strategies and in the depth and quality of Unilever's management. Now, with that, I will hand it over to Paul. And after Paul has spoken, there will be a few, few full question and answer session during which you will have the opportunity to ask about the progress of the business in detail. So thank you very much, Paul. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you, Moraine, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Before looking back at uh, last year, it's probably worth reminding ourselves what we're trying to achieve here. This is a company built not just over decades, but over centuries on the back of a long-term compounded growth model and a clear sense of responsibilities it has in this world. In other words, a company that has invested continuously in those things that drive responsible growth and shareholder value, not just one quarter or one year, but year in, year out. Investments in people, in brands and innovation, in world-class manufacturing or leading R&D, sustainable and fair supply chains, or simply in strengthening the local communities in which we live and operate. This multi-stakeholder approach has been at the roots of Unilever's long-term success. In fact, I would argue it is the reason for Unilever's long-term success. If you take any period in the history of Unilever, Unilever has significantly outperformed the market. Over the last 30 years, for example, the company has delivered a total shareholder return of over 3,000% compared to the AEX, which has an average increase over that period of 1,800%. And in 2017, again, the year that we cover was this AGM, our TSR of 26% compares very favorably with 17% of the overall index. This consistency of delivery is exemplified by the fact that Unilever has now enjoyed nine consecutive years of competitive top and bottom line performance. There aren't many companies that can claim that. In fact, very few. So it's a model we firmly believe in. One that not only serves our shareholders well, but which has also responded to the growing demands for more sustainable and equitable forms of growth. It is a model, in my opinion, that proves that business can be a force for good and also do good for our shareholders at the same time. The two not only go hand in hand, they are both needed to guarantee our long-term success. Indeed, Companies focused on ESG, or what we call environmental, social, and governance, have been shown to significantly outperform their peers. For example, and you'll see that it should not come as a surprise, anticipating and mitigating the risk of climate change, or reducing waste in your value chain, or increasing your sustainable sourcing, or ensuring that you have a gender-balanced organization where everybody can rise to their fullest potential. All these are proving to be good business moves. In fact, according to a McKinsey study, companies focused on this approach have enjoyed 36% higher earnings growth over the last 10 years. For Unilever, we've delivered this model successfully in very volatile conditions and in markets that have been changing faster than I believe any time in history. Looking ahead, we expect this exponential rate of change to continue or may I say even accelerate. In fact, we see three big disruptions that we believe go on impacting our industry. And it's worth taking a look at each of them in turn. First is the growing threat of climate change. The human and environmental costs of this are very clear, certainly for the 9 million people who die every year of air pollution, or the 80 million people who are denied food due to climate-related droughts, 
or perhaps the 100 million people that risk being pushed back into poverty. Now, I'm not even talking about the 200 million people that are expected to become climate refugees over the next 20 to 30 years. I believe that's reason enough to act, I would think. But there's also a profound economic cost. Currently, the IMF, for example, estimates, that's the International Monetary Fund, estimates that the total, total cost of climate change already today in this world is over $5.3 trillion. That's equivalent to 14% of the global GDP. In the US alone, climate change-related costs over the normal patterns were over $300 billion last year alone. There's no wonder that there are growing numbers of companies are now reporting on climate-related risks in line with the recommendations on the bloomberg Carney Task Force on Carbon Disclosure. It's no wonder that many investors are actively reviewing their portfolios and decarbonizing their risks. Funds with assets of over $5 trillion under management have actually committed to divest themselves from any fossil fuel holdings. Climate change is the biggest existential threat that we face. And thankfully, as Unilever, we've started early in reducing and now eliminating our reliance on carbon. We've done this by de-risking our supply chain, including through the use of responsible sourcing of ingredients just like palm oil. The second area is the escalation of the digital revolution. From the Internet of Things, to robotics, to artificial intelligence, to data analytics, from voice to virtual reality. Digital technologies are disrupting and in some cases obsoleting whole industry sectors. For our industry, digital is transforming every stage of the consumer journey, from the way consumers hear about and interact with our products to the way that they shop for and experience our products. All are changing dramatically. Take the phenomenal increase in voice-activated devices, for example, to search for products and ideas online, everything from beauty tips to recipes. By 2020, not far from now, it is expected that 50%, that is 50% of all searches will be by voice. That's a huge change for the industry. Now here is a short film I wanted to share with you, just how one of our brands, Lipton in this case, is responding to the opportunities of the digital age by using social and search data to capitalize on this emerging trend. Just have a look. This is the story of how Lipton spotted a blossoming tea trend through the groundbreaking use of social and search data and democratized that trend so effectively that sales skyrocketed. In 2016, digital data revealed matcha was a burgeoning super drink among America's trend-setting healthy women. Lipton pounced. Using a new way of working, they co-created the product with consumers and bought premium tea to the masses. To start, Lipton mined two years of data on search and social platforms. Data revealed that the Japanese drink originated from Los Angeles, but then moved quickly from speciality stores to fashion after parties. The social data also informed us that females who cared about well-being with middle to higher incomes showed a growing interest in matcha. We chose influencers accordingly. Our tagline, a moment of focus, encouraged our audience to savor the moment with a 360 YouTube video that got 6.6 .6 million views. And Unilever's first social media inspired product was on store shelves in just seven months. So let me turn to the third disruption for uh, very briefly. Indeed, what is happening in the areas of environment I talked about and digital, there's another element that consumers themselves obviously are changing as expectations are constantly being reset. People are increasingly concerned about the impacts their purchases have on the environment and society. They want companies and products they can trust and that make a broader contribution to their lives. They don't just want to buy products they can buy, they want ideas they can buy into. Hence the rapid growth in brands with purpose and in products that speak to a desire for more natural, authentic, and often local attributes. At the same time in a world of sparse, uh, scarce resources, there's also a growing lack of tolerance for escalating waste, whether in food, plastic, packaging, or water. Business is now expected to be part of the solution to these resource challenges as well as to the many social issues that we face, whether making advertising free of outdated and harmful stereotypes, or 
simply eliminating modern day slavery in the supply chain, or in providing employment and training opportunities for refugees. In fact, according to the latest survey, 75% of the people say they now expect brands to not be just less bad, but to have a positive and proactive contribution to improve the qualities of people's lives. What's wrong with that? Yet to date, only 40% of the people think that this is actually happening. It's not surprising to, uh, perhaps for too many when too many companies still think that by simply outsourcing their supply chain, they can also outsource their responsibilities. Not at Unilever. By taking broader responsibilities and by driving transparency in all we do, we have built an enormous trust amongst the citizens that we serve. And I believe that will serve as well in the future. While none of these trends I have mentioned today might be entirely new to you, the speed with which they are impacting our lives and disrupting our industries is accelerating rapidly. In fact, last year saw the fastest rate of increase. Succeeding in this environment requires business models to be both resilient enough to withstand these shocks, but also agile enough to be able to respond quickly to these new and emerging opportunities. This is the model that we've been working on now for some time and which we continued in 2017. Whether in simplifying our organizational model or in developing our capabilities or in evolving our portfolio of, of purpose-driven brands, we made progress last year in each of them, making Unilever even more resilient and more agile as an organization. Now let me take each of those very briefly in turn. Let's start with the organization. When, accelerating, when we accelerated the implementation of the Connected for Growth organization, we made perhaps one of the biggest change programs that Unilever has ever undertaken. A major rewiring and simplification of the business. But more than this, by empowering our frontline people of our business to respond almost in real time to these fast changes in consumer needs and market dynamics, Connected for Growth is unleashing a tide of entrepreneurship within the company. It is enabling us to get the best of both being global and being local. Now, we saw many examples of this last year, and I think contributed to some of the success that you've been seeing, including the launch of six entirely new brands into the market, all in response to the kind of consumer changes and preferences that I referred to earlier. Something, frankly, we could never have done before at this speed and scale. Beautiful brands, brands like Hijab Fresh, Love Beauty and Planet, Ayush. We've been able to increase dramatically the speed with which we innovate around these existing brands as well. Take the Netherlands, for example, where we are now. Andre Long, a wonderful brand, has created a new best-selling hair care range for those with blonde or gray hair. Having identified early a growing trend amongst the young with silver hair, they quickly launched a new silver care range for a younger, millennial audience, including those with blonde hair. And there's still enough of those in the Netherlands. Different ads with different propositions were used, targeted either at millennials or Generation Silver, all in the digital space. In just four weeks' time, the product achieved the number one spot in the Dutch hair wash and care market, doubling the volume of the previous number one silver shampoo. That's an impressive achievement, and one that has inspired two of our other global hair care brands to follow suit by launching a silver care hair range themselves. Now, I believe that's just a, one, but a great example of Connected for Growth in Action, showing how local insights are feeding faster and faster into our global innovation pipeline. Secondly is building capabilities, because skill sets of yesterday simply will not meet the needs of tomorrow. We actually don't start from a bad place here, having built digital capabilities over recent years that have been recognized as amongst the best in our industry. But we're developing these further, including with our pioneering in-house people data centers. These are enabling us to use real-time analysis to engage with consumers to even more immediately and do that in a more meaningful way. All part of our ambition, actually, to create one billion one-on-one -on -one consumer relationships. Also, in our, our in-house Unilever U Studios, as we call them, are improving our creative and production facilities, again, 
to give us greater agility at lower cost. And to date, 5,000 marketeers have been through our Connected World digital training programs. All these programs and the insights they are bringing are driving our brand propositions and helping us respond to the growing demand for online purpose. Last year, uh, online purchase, sorry. Last year, for example, online sales for our brands increased by a staggering 80%, meaning that we now have an e-commerce business with sales of more than 1.7 billion euros. The third element is our portfolio. Again, with the changes we've already made, we start here as well from a strong base. Our core brands account for 75% of our growth, and I believe are well positioned to continue to grow strongly. 13 of these core brands have a turnover in excess of 1 billion euro. 80% of our brands come from leading positions, either number one or number two in the markets in which they compete. In fact, it is a measure of the strength of our portfolio that more of our brands appear in the Kantar global ranking of most chosen brands than any other company. However, we also recognize that we need to continuously sharpen and refresh the portfolio to ensure that we are well positioned in the new and faster growing markets of the future, whether connecting with millennials or entering new channels or bringing new and relevant concepts and technologies to the market. This is why over the last three years, we have made 21 acquisitions and nearly 50 over the last 10 years. 12 of these acquisitions came last year alone, making it one of the most active M&A periods in the history of Unilever. In the process, we acquired some wonderful assets and have been joined by some amazing founders. Each brings something new to our business. Some, for example, are giving us access to attractive markets where we are already present, but currently underrepresented. Carrefour Korea would be a good example, a very strategic North Asian beauty business that is helping us meet the growing demands for the Korean skincare products. Sundial, the Sundial brand, would be another example, with its focus on underserved skin needs with brands like Shea Moisture. Some are helping us expand in complementary or adjacent part of the market, ones where we see real growth opportunities, but where we're not really present yet. Good examples of that would be our air purification with Blue Air, or our herbal teas with Puka, or our re-entry into color cosmetics with a brand called Hourglass. Yet again, other acquisitions are giving us regional scale in existing divisions. For example, good examples here are the Koala home and personal care business in Latin America that we were able to acquire, or in Myanmar buying the leading home care business to become the number one company by far in that country. And finally, some give us a presence and a capability that we need to win in this rapidly changing emerging markets or channels or direct to the consumer subscription models. A good example of that would be the Dollar Shave Club or our prestige beauty business that we have acquired over the last few years. Now we recognize that if you make 50 acquisitions, not all might succeed. But in total, we expect these acquisitions, together with disposals, to add about 1% to our top line growth by 2019 onwards, moving us upwards, therefore, to the 3 to 5% range that we've been targeting. Now, one of the consequences of constantly strengthening and refreshing our portfolio is the need to also divest of businesses that no longer fit with our overall strategy, and where we believe others are better placed to develop these brands. This has been an equally port, uh, important part of our M&A strategy for many years and continued last year when we took the difficult but necessary decision to exit the spreads business. It is not easy to say goodbye to businesses and brands that have been part of Unilever since its beginning and which have brought so much to the company over time. Strategically, though, it was the right decision to do and in KKR, the spreads business moves into the hands of an owner who will give the wonderful brands the focus and attention that they need and deserve. The sale that we did for $6.8 billion reflects the value they see in this business. And it's a wonderful testament to what has been built over many years by many people. 
We expect to complete this sale around the middle of the year. In the meantime, those working in spreads remain as committed as ever to building these brands, which simply reinforces our appreciation as well as our pride in everything that they have achieved. The fourth area I briefly mentioned is our purpose-driven model, as captured by the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. This is the thread that runs through everything we do. It's an enormous beacon during volatile times, and it finds the greatest expression in our brands. Brands like Lifeboy, whose mission is to ensure that no child dies needlessly from diseases like pneumonia or diarrhea. 420 million have now been reached with its life-saving handwashing program. Take Dove, with its mission to improve self-esteem and body image, especially of young women. 29 million adolescent girls have been reached with its confidence-building programs. Take Domestos, fighting the outrage of open defecation, something that still affects a billion people in this world, not any of us. More than 10 million people have been reached thanks to Domestos and giving them access to toilets and decent sanitation on the way to their target of 25 million people. Then we take our food brands. We are proud to be helping over 8 million people a year continuously in our partnerships with the World Food Program and others like the Food Bank to give them a chance to have a decent meal at least once a day. Knorr already alone provides 3 million school meals continuously to undernourished children throughout the year. Across the world today, our oral care brands provide another service. Toothaches and dental decay is one of the most widespread diseases still in many parts of the world. In fact, it is sometimes the biggest factor preventing children from attending school. Millions of school days are lost, depriving people from the opportunities to participate in our economies. Our oral care brands like Prodent or Pepsodent or Signal are fighting this with education programs to simply brush twice a day, every day. Now, we've been working this for more than 25 years, and we've already reached over 30 million children and their parents. Take a look at this short film of how this campaign is actually coming alive in one of our African countries, this time Ghana. <laughs> My name is Mauli. I'm a dentist and I live in Accra. For many years, I've been performing checkups and organizing educational school programs all around Ghana. So we work hard to stop oral issues. In circle like that, okay? You understand? Yes. Right. But still one or two people suffer from toothaches. And almost every adult have cavities. That's why this year I've decided to do something else. Something special. data or speech will convince you to brush day and night. But your smile will. Because every smile matters. That's why at Pepsodent, together with thousands of teachers and dentists like Maoli all over the world, we have spent 25 years taking care of more than 75 million smiles with our free dental checkups and school programs. 
just gives you an idea. And, and then, frankly, I, I owe you a scorecard. Last year when we were here, I talked about Vaseline and its healing project. Well, I'm happy to report that one year later, this project now has reached 3 million people living in poverty or in crisis situations, just helping them provide relief. And then, by the way, as a final thought, we estimate that we've helped about 200 million people now with access to safe drinking water, thanks to a brand that we have called Purit. All there to achieve what we would call the Sustainable Development Goals. These are big numbers. These are big projects. These are big impacts. All part of our commitment under the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan to improve the health and well-being of a billion people around the world. Now, not surprisingly, we are finding that the deeper the purpose, the faster these brands actually grow. Last year, they delivered 70% of Unilever's turnover. And we were pleased just at this week that we were named the number one company in the Fit for Purpose Index. The organizers recognize, and I quote, Unilever's outstanding commitment to implement a long-term purpose-driven strategy. So in all these areas, organization, capabilities, portfolio, and purpose, we made huge advances last year to strengthen our model and in giving us the kind of resilience and agility needed to compete today and in the future. Certainly, each area contributed to another year of strong performance. Our results in 2017 were good. Underlying sales was up 3.5%, despite some very, very challenging market conditions. Growth was competitive and profitable. Good delivery again against our efficiency programs, combined with further step up in our innovations. That actually meant that underlying operating margins improved by a whopping 110 basis points to 17.5%. This keeps us well on track to deliver our operating margin ambitions of 20% by 2020. Now, after growth and profit, we also measure ourselves against the quality of cash flow delivery. Again, 2017 was a very healthy year. Despite making a sizable contribution to support our pension funds, free cash flow improved by over 600 million euros to 5.4 billion euros. This means that over the last five years alone, Unilever has delivered 22 billion euros in free cash flow. And you will be pleased to know that despite the acquisitions that we have made, that the return on invested capital stayed above 19%. Growth in 2017 was of high quality, with good balance between price and volume, and was broad-based across all of our divisions. Home care has been one of our best performing divisions, and last year grew by 4.4%. This 10.6 billion business has a wonderful footprint in the fast-growing, developing, and emerging markets. The division has some of the great brands that we all like, brands like Omo, Sunlight, Sif, and Romain. Its growth last year came from all parts of the business, fabric solutions, fabric sensations, water, as well as air purification. The beauty and personal care business, which represents about 40% of Unilever's turnover, grew last year by 2.9%. At 21 billion euros, this division is already the world's, the world's third largest beauty and personal care business, with five brands turning over more than 1 billion euros per year each. Dove itself is now over a 4 billion euro business and growing strongly again last year by over 6%, thanks to some great innovations and the rollout of Baby Dove to a further 20 markets. Last year, we also announced the intention to combine our food and refreshment business into a single division, making it, again, a global powerhouse of more than 22.5 billion euros. In total, these businesses grew last year by 2.7%, with a noticeable performance in ice cream of more than 5.3%, driven by some fantastic innovations. Innovations like Magnum Pines, which was launched in 19 markets in just 12 months' time. Overall, we finished the year last year strongly, and I'm pleased to say that momentum has continued into 2018. Our first quarter results were good. We grew the top line by 3.7%, driven by very strong volume growth. All three divisions grew, and encouragingly, we saw a continuation of the pickup in emerging markets, with growth in the first quarter of 5.1%. Following the commitment we gave in connection with the sales of spreads, 
We also announced a share buyback plan of up to 6 million euros, as well as a very attractive quarterly dividend increase once more of 8%. That's over 40 years in a row of consecutive increases on average of 8%. The pickup in emerging markets that I mentioned bodes well for the remainder of the year. Now that said, we expect trading conditions to remain volatile and the pace of change and market disruption, if anything, to increase further. As I've set out today to you, we believe that we are ready for this and that we're confident meeting our ambitions that we've set for the 2020 targets. To do that, however, it is vital that we go on maximizing the benefits from our Connected for Growth program, as well as delivering on the efficiencies programs that we have been running across the company. These cover everything from supply chain to R&D to overheads and to the creation of smaller, leaner corporate center. By making us even more efficient, they will help us find the six billions of savings by 2020. These programs will not only generate the fuel for growth, as we plan to invest four of the six billion of savings behind our brands, but they are also key to simplify the organization and increase the speed of action and decision making. And the proposals you heard Marijn outline earlier to unify our legal entity into one are also part of this process of simplifying our structure, increasing our speed, and enhancing our options in a world of rapid change. Finally, for all the talk of market disruption and transformation, important as they are, let me assure you that investing in people and talent remains our number one priority. All of the figures I've quoted for you last year, perhaps the one that gives me most satisfaction, is that 90% of our own people in a global survey expressed their pride in working for Unilever. That's a remarkable figure for a company of our size and scale and well above the industry norms. It's a testimony, I believe, to the ethos of the business and to the relevance of our purpose-driven business model. Something also highlighted by the fact that last year Unilever was named once more the most desired FMCG employer in 44 of the 52 markets that we measure. That's actually up by a quarter on an already very high figure that we had the year before. Central to our people agenda is the creation of a diverse and inclusive workforce. We have to be reflective in an organization of the people we actually serve and ensure that we get the richness of thought and ideas that a diverse workforce brings. We're on a journey here, but we've made further progress again last year, including in the area of gender balance. Like everything else, it starts at the top, which is why I'm so pleased, as you've seen and heard today, that five of our 11 non-executive executive board members are actually women. A third of the executive leadership team is also women. And nearly half of the company, 47%, to be surprised, of our total management are actually women. So good progress, in fact, in the top league compared to any other company, although we once more would say more work to do. In conclusion, let me briefly recap. Our long-term compounded growth model is alive and well and continuing to deliver superior returns to Unilever shareholders. We continue to believe in the model and the multi-stakeholder approach that underpins it. Though we see this big disruptions to our markets and our sector, we are confident that we have the resilience and agility to win. We have a simpler, more consumer-facing organization, and hence strengths and capabilities in digital, a stronger and sharper portfolio, better weighted to growth opportunities. And we have purpose-led brands that speak to the growing desire of people for business to be part of a solution and not a problem to today's challenges. Above all, we have people with the talent dedication, passion, and values needed to take this business forward in an uncertain and unpredictable world. Their efforts contributed to another strong year in Unilever in 2017, our ninth consecutive year of consistent market-beating performance. I want to thank them especially for that and for all they bring to our purpose and to the purpose bringing it to life in our company every day in every part of our business. I also want to thank Marijn and my fellow board members for their continued support and their wise counsel, 
We're truly fortunate to have a board like that. And finally, I'd like to thank you as shareholders for your faith in the company and for your faith in a responsible, long-term, compounded growth model. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, 